Last time, we discussed how to build and program the Summer Kart 64, the first open source flash kart for the Nintendo 64. Hopefully everything went well and you were able to complete your own Summer Kart 64. But what if you weren't able to get it to program? Or if your computer couldn't even detect it? Or what if you wanted the latest firmware but are still stuck on an older version? Then you're in luck because today we are going to troubleshoot and update the Summer Kart 64. Welcome back to the N-Galaxy Workshop. We've already built our Summer Kart 64, but now we're having some problems. This card is working just fine, but it's on firmware version 2.18.1. I'm also not entirely happy with the way the cart came out, and I could probably do better if I spent a little bit more time with it, but maybe there's also an easier way to do it. This cart isn't being detected by my computer. I'll plug it in by USB, but there's no indication that it's being connected. Finally, I'll go over a couple of the issues I had while making my first couple of copies of the Summer Kart 64. I could get the cart to connect to my computer, program the FT232HLEE prom using FTProg, but couldn't finish the programming due to a couple of different errors. So let's see what went wrong with each of these and how to get them ready to be played. This video will be broken up into six chapters, so hopefully it will help you find your specific issue. First up, let's update this Summer Cry 64 from the last time. It's working just fine, I'm able to play my game, but I want the latest firmware and to get a new shell on it. We'll start, of course, by removing the two screws in the back of the cart. Now that we've removed the PCB, let's take it over to the computer and get the latest software. We're going to go to the Summer Kart 64 website, summerkart64.dev. From there, we can click on Downloads and get taken to the latest firmware, version 2.20.2. .2. We want the SC64 firmware v2.20.2.bin file. I'm also going to grab the SC64 deployer windows v2.20.2 .2 zip file. I'm going to extract the zip folder and then copy the firmware file over to that folder. Then, to make things a bit easier, I'll copy them over to my SC64 folder in my C drive. Now, we're going to open up command prompt and change the directory to where we have the new firmware. We could just type in cd c colon slash sc64 slash sc64 dash deployer dash windows dash v2.20.2 or we can click the address bar and copy and paste this into the command prompt window. Once we're in the proper directory, we can then type in sc64 deployer to see the commands available. We're running the 2.20.2 .2 deployer and we still have version 2.18.1 firmware, so it won't let us do too much here just yet. So let's get that installed. We're going to type in sc64 deployer firmware update sc64-firmware-v2.20.2.bin and then enter. It verifies the file and asks us if we want to update. Type in Y and then enter to start. At this point, it warns us not to unplug the Summer Cry 64. Doing so may break the device. I would also consider plugging in any laptops being used to update the firmware to prevent any issue. And just like that, it's updated. The LED on the Summer Kart 64 should blink 10 times very quickly, showing that it has been successfully updated. Now that we're showing the updated firmware version, let's put this PCB into a new shell. I picked these shells up from the Fina Mod Shop for about $5 each. As a very pleasant surprise, I also got some new labels for the front and the back. They already have all the openings needed for both the USB Type-C and SD card and access to the button on the back of the PCB. I'm going to place the labels on first, trying to line up one edge and then slowly placing the sticker down, running my finger across the label to try and prevent any air bubbles getting under the label. I ordered these PCBs from PCB way back in June of 2024. At that time, while the holes for the cartridge shell were fine for a standard cartridge shell, they were a bit too small for the Phenom Lodge Shop shells. This was updated around August of 2024, so if you've had yours made after that, you won't have to worry about this step. I'm going to take a 7 64 drill bit and expand the hole slightly. 
When drilling into a PCB, take special care that where you are drilling, you won't drill through any hidden traces. This PCB is only two layers, but many modern devices may use several more layers. On this PCB, I'm only drilling through a ground plane. No need to worry about grounding out any traces. However, it is important to make sure that the PCB is clean and no metal shavings are causing shorts anywhere else. Once that is done, it's as simple as placing the PCB into the new shell and it's good to go. The Fina Mod Shop has five color options, including clear, crystal blue, atomic purple, mint green, and red. I only have examples of crystal blue and red. I looked all over for a clear red cartridge shell months ago with no luck, so finding one like this that was already set up for the Summer Crate 64 was amazing. Look forward to the project I'll be using that for in the future. Let's move on to the next card I'm having trouble with. This PCB won't connect to my computer. When I plug it in, there is no sound indicating a new USB device has been connected. I'm not a pro at this. I can put things together, but when there are issues, I tend to stumble around a lot and hopefully figure things out. First thing I want to look at is that if the USB-C port is working, I take a Type-C to 2.0 Type-A cable and connect it to the PCB. I use a 2.0 Type-A cable because then there will be only 4 pins to check and they will be much larger than on a Type-C to Type-C cable. I check the ground and 5 volt connections, followed by both data pins. I'm getting a connection across all of them. I then looked at the bill of materials to try and figure out which chip would handle the USB interface. FT232HL has USB bridge and USB to UART listed under the detailed description, so that's what I'm going to check next. I've inspected the chip and I don't see any solder bridges. I've applied more flux and reflowed the chip, but still no luck gaining it to be detected by my computer. So in the off chance that the chip is bad, I've ordered new ones and I will be replacing it. There are 48 legs on this chip, so while it may be possible to use some slow melt solder and a soldering iron and a bit of time to remove it, I'll be using my hot air station. After applying flux to the chip, I'm using hot air in a circular motion around the chip while adding very gentle pressure with my tweezers. When removing components, you want to be very careful not to lift the pads that the legs are attached to. While some repairs are possible, it does increase the difficulty and the possibility of the PCB failing again, depending on its use. Now that I have the chip off, I'll clean up and inspect the area. I also want to check the surrounding area in case any of the solder from this chip managed to get anywhere else on the board, or if any other chip was lifted in the process. After using more flux, I'm going to apply solder to the chip as shown in the build video. I use the flux to help hold the chip in place, make sure everything is lined up, and add a bit of solder to a leg or two. If everything is still lined up, I go to the other side of the chip to add solder to that side. Now that the chip isn't going anywhere, I finish soldering each leg. Now let's go see if it's detected by the computer. And nothing. Still not connecting. I check each leg of the chip again, but I still don't see anything. I'm about to give up on this one when I decide to check the ECS 120 and 500 oscillators along with the FC 135 crystal. These three components have all of their pads underneath them. I run the hot air over each one while using my tweezers to apply gentle pressure. I try connecting the USB cable to my SummerCrest 64 one more time and I hear... That did it! Looking at the PCB design files, I believe it was only the ECS3225MV120 oscillator that was problematic. It connects to the FT232HL chip here. While I can follow these diagrams and put hardware together, I don't really understand how a lot of this works, so if I'm wrong, hopefully someone will correct me. At this point, I connect the PCB to my computer and start programming the Summer Cart 64. So finally, a couple of problems I've seen either with my own cards or that others have had issues with online. With this example, I'm able to connect it to my computer and it's showing up on port COM5. I can program the FT323HLE prom using FTProg. But when I run the command to program the FPGA microcontroller and bootloader, I get a couple of different errors. First error you can get when connecting the USB to UART adapter is this one saying error while running bring up could not connect to the STM32. No ack knack byte received. 
This could be caused by a couple of issues, but let's start with the easiest. Looking at the wires I have plugged in, I can see that I connected the transmit pin to transmit and receive to receive. By switching these around so that transmit is to receive and receive is to transmit, I can continue. In earlier versions of the installation, it was important to type YES in all caps, but it seems like this has been changed as both upper and lowercase now work. There were a couple of times I received error while running bring up, invalid FPGA ID value received, or invalid token received. Almost any error I got at this point seemed to be an issue with my soldering. I ended up going back over each chip and making sure everything had a solid connection and no solder bridges. A bit of extra flux would be very helpful to make sure that these connections are made where they should be and none where they shouldn't be. Depending on which step the error happens can also help you figure out which chip could be causing the problem. Look at where the programmer stopped and then look for the chip it was trying to program. Check any solder joints to that chip, then also follow any traces away from it to check where it connects to other chips. Now I've shown a couple of different problems and how to potentially solve them, but just because you're getting the same error doesn't mean this is the exact same way to fix it. As shown, most problems are going to be caused by incorrect soldering. With such fine pitch components, a microscope becomes almost necessary to be able to see. Now that each one of these cards are ready to be played, we can test each one in a Nintendo 64. Happy gaming, everyone.